student, I was also a mother. And I needed two things, money and a babysitter. One day as I was walking up and down campus, I saw an advert saying, play a computer game for one hour and be paid 30 rand. I immediately went to the computer science lab, found four white males playing the game, no surprise. And I inquired, what's the age limit for someone to play your game? They said, none. Problems solved. I went straight to aftercare, fetched my son, three-year-old, took him to, to play the games. I made 60 rand, and I got a babysitter for two hours. <laughs> we are a family of gamers. That story started when I started dating my boyfriend and he used to take me to his mom's work. He would play games for hours, Pac-Man. And when he's tired, he will decide, let's leave. That was him taking me out. <laughs> and that ritual became part of who we are. I would watch him and the kids playing game challenge with all his friends for hours and hours and me saving snacks. Now there's a difference between me going to a computer lab and finding four male, white male guys playing a computer game and me watching games at home. The ones at home, it was just fun. The ones there, I saw a code. I also have to mention that the following day, when I went to see the guys, I came in with my son again. They said, we'll let him play on condition. You watch him. So when I watched him, that two hours of watching him changed my life. I saw a code and I fell in love. I'm one of those people who self-taught themselves how to code. And after learning how to code, I moved from just coding for a living and teaching girls how to code to managing people who write code for a living. Move from there to managing people who run startups. And with startups, they write code to change the world. All startups, they believe they are going to change the world. And that journey took me to this. The picture that you see there is that it's me in 2015. I was selected to go and represent South Africa in Silicon Valley through Tech Woman. And I used to walk around the street. And one of the things I did was spend time at Google campus. And that's a self-driving car. That car knows exactly when to stop, how to drive without any human in it. The only human in it is a passenger. It drives itself. And that was 2015. For me, that was very fascinating. However, me as a human being, one day I was running a bit late. I saw a red traffic light and I crossed right through it. But you know, I was stopped right in the middle. As I went, I put my first step, I had stop. And I thought, oh. I looked left and right, there's no one. I went again. When I did my second step, I had stop go back, and I immediately went back and I realized, oh, the traffic light is talking to me. Now when you put all this together, you realize this is big data. A car can drive itself and all these things are connected around you. That the traffic lights are talking to me and trust me, I obeyed. I went backwards and I stopped because it had said when it's your turn, it will turn green and then you can walk. <laughs> and then I waited until it turned green and I walked. However, when it comes to big data, there are things that we really need to think of because big data lives on the internet. And one of the moments that really haunted me in my life was 23rd March 2016, when Microsoft launched Tay, a millennium-inspired chatbot. It was hiding behind a form of an avatar of a 19-year-old. So most of the people that spoke to her thought they were speaking to their hero, a 19-year-old, they really loved. But let's look at what they did to this poor Tay. When Tay arrived, 8.14, hello world. You can see that she's millennial inspired. She's got O as a globe. And let's see what happened two hours later.
That was Tay's last tweet. And if you are sitting there asking yourself, how can human beings in 16 hours turn a chatbot into a Hitler-loving, sexist, racist robot, you think about big data. Think about what we're putting every day on the internet and who have access to the internet. Those people who have access to internet also are perpetuating what we call algorithm bias. We all know when you write an algorithm, you're giving computers instruction. When you create that avatar, you write instructions for it, what it can do, what it can't do, and if it's not represented enough, if it's not representing the world, you're gonna have that kind of a situation. That's not the AI we want. That is not the AI we're looking forward to. And as much as we can get excited about AI, we need to relook really at ourselves as humanity. And that's why, if my grandmother saw that, she would have asked me, Baratang, butubaha tebuile kai. And I would have said she doesn't have. In English, what happened to today's humanity? The thing is, Tay was influenced by the users, was built in an, in a, by an algorithm that was reflecting white males in a lab. We all know that there's lack of women in tech. If you look at that, in the globe there, there's, a, there's data already, it's heavy, it's already influenced, and it's influenced by a certain number of people who have access to that internet. And when those people start putting their dirty, immature thoughts, and if, we, if you think of it, a 19-year-old will attract immature millennials. I'm not saying in 15 years' time from now we should blame millennials. I'm saying we should think of our algorithms, involve everybody, be diverse enough to be able to influence when the designers pull that sample of information that they can design from, it should be reflective of ourselves and who we are. And they should bring diversity into their spaces to make sure that the people that are going to reach this information, because they are not building AI for today, they are building AI for the future. Today, it's 20, 19. In 16 years' time, it will, we can repeat the same mistake of what we did in the past. If you look at the next slide, there's women at, like Ada Lovelace who wrote the first algorithm in the 18th century. There's Grace Hopper who put together the first compiler. And then there's Catherine Johnson who led the team that took us to the moon. And if you look at the history of what's on the internet, you hardly ever find these women. And that's why, if I was still talking to my grandmother, I know she believed white males are very intelligent. And I always told her they are very privileged. If you use your privilege properly, we will be able to change the world. The tech world is still very white and it's still very male. And we, <laughs> live in a world where you see people like me who want to involve everybody. And I formed Girl Hype 16 years ago with the intention of getting more girls in tech. And I landed up in tech woman, a self-taught woman, belong to a group of women who travel the world and believe we can change the world through diversity and inclusion. And these women are reaching out to young girls and other women. I was asked a personal story one day when I was doing a presentation in Addis, and I was talking to policymakers, and the, the lady asked me after the presentation, Baratang, if you believe algorithms are so biased and they're still reflective of what the society thinks and who is in charge of the algorithms, why are you teaching it to the girls? We want our girls to be able to write those algorithms. We want our girls to write AI for Africa and solve African problems and come up with solutions that will be reflective of all of us, and bring humanity to AI.